This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Life is about stepping into our power as conscious creators to live the life we want to experience and enabling others to do the same. Valerie Atelis interviews Harriet Hodgson, the author of Grief Doodling, Bringing Back Your Smiles. Rochester, Minnesota resident Harriet Hodgson has been a freelance writer for 43 years, is the author of thousands of articles and 42 books. Two new books are in production now. She is a BS from Wheelock College of Education and Human Development at Boston University, an MA from the University of Minnesota, and additional graduate training. After four family members died in 2007, the focus of Hodgson's work changed from health and wellness to grief healing, and she is the author of 10 grief resources. Hodgson cared for three generations of family members. When her disabled husband was dying, she searched for ways to de-stress. To her surprise, She found a half hour of doodling refreshed her, and she was able to return to caregiving with new energy. If doodling helped her, Hodgson figured it could help others. Hodgson is assistant editor of the Open to Hope website, a member of the Association of Healthcare Journalists, Alliance of Independent Authors, Rave Reviews Book Club, Rave Writers International Society of Authors, and Minnesota Coalition of Death Education and Support. She has appeared on more than 190 talk radio shows, including CBS Radio, dozens of television stations, including CNN, and dozens of blog talk radio programs. A popular guest, she has given presentation at public health, Alzheimer's, bereavement, and caregiving conferences. Meet Harriet at HarrietHodgson.com. Here is the interview with Harriet Hodgson. In your own words, who is Harriet Hodgson? Harriet Hodgson is a former teacher, surprising writer. The surprise was mine. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And a grandmother and a great-grandmother and a person with a lot of life experience. How do you describe what grief is and what has been your most profound experiences with it? I never thought I would write books about grief. But in 2007, four family members died in a row. The first was my daughter, the mother of my twin grandchildren. And then my father-in-law, who died the same weekend as my daughter. And then my twin grandchildren's father died, and my brother died. And it almost just felled me. I mean, I My. I didn't know how I could go on. My. But a week after my daughter died, I went to my computer and started pouring out my soul, just trying to cope with grief. And grief is basically uh, intense loss, obviously uh, a shock, even though you're prepared for it. And it is something that changes your life forever. Yeah, I have heard that before here on the podcast that grief doesn't end, it changes. I keep hearing that over and over. And another interesting phrase that I heard from somebody, one of my guests, is uh, grief is the price of love. Do you agree with that? I absolutely agree. 
agree. We would yeah. not grieve yeah. if we did not love. Right. So, right. you know, grief is the result of love. And of course, we don't want to um, lose things and people that we love. Yeah. But uh, if you keep focusing on love, I think it is easier to adjust to grief. Um, what is love to you? And what are some of the ways that we can express love from your perspective? Love is probably the most profound feeling that humans can feel. And when you truly love someone, you care about them more than you care about yourself. Mm. And you would be willing to sacrifice for that person. I think the other thing that I have discovered about love is that it lasts forever. It, it transcends time. And, and so I am basically still a new widow. Uh, my husband died at the end of November. Uh, and yet my love for him is stronger than ever. Yeah. And I am using that love. I am building on that love and creating a new life. It, it is my foundation. Do you believe in life after death? Do you have any spiritual beliefs or practices? It's interesting you should ask that because I have just read a book yesterday called Life After Life. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I read it is that I wanted to learn more about death. And it was written by a physician. And my husband was a physician. Mm. And uh, I'm starting a book today called Near Death in the ICU, in the intensive care unit. And I've read quite a few stories now about people who've had near-death experiences. And there are very strong similarities in their stories. Yeah. And I believe them. So I'm not sure what you would call that. I am not sure what faith it represents. Right. But clearly there is a change from this life into some other existence. Another question I have for you is about the purpose of the human experience. What do you think that is? A lot of people have grappled with that question, yeah. including <laughs> the Dalai Lama. Yes. And he says the purpose of our life can be summarized in one word, mm. and that word is love. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think the purpose of our life uh, when you look back on your life, is yeah. to be kind, to help others, to love, and to spread love. What is healing to you? And is there a destination for healing? Can we say one day that we are healed? I think that depends on how you define healing. Uh, I do not think that you, quote, recover from a loved one's death. I think you come to terms with it, you reconcile your feelings, and you basically work on healing yourself. After my husband died, and after all my other loved ones died in 2007, I figured I had several options. I could sit around and wait to be rescued. Uh, I could sit in a chair and wait for my own death. Or I could be proactive and start helping myself. And that is the option I chose. And I wonder, Harriet, why some of us make those choices to rebuild, to revive, to renew, to restart, and some of us don't. Do you wonder? I have wondered that, and I decided that every living thing is a miracle. Yeah. Every human being is a miracle, yeah. and I'm not going to waste the miracle of my life. Mm. I have more things to do. As I said before we started recording, I'm going to be 86 years old yeah. in September. I have things that I still want to do. I have two books in production. I write a column for a newsletter. I belong to three literary organizations. I give free webinars and talks. So I am trying to really 
enjoy and savor and live every day of my life. This is something that you have learned from your parents, people around you, or this is something innate? Well, it can be partially innate. I think my mother was a strong person. Yeah. But we need to remember that strong people can get tired and mm. fall. True. And sometimes they, they need a boost yeah. from another person who cares. That could be a, your partner, your husband, your wife, another relative, a dear friend. And quite frankly, I got tired of people saying to me, oh, you, you are strong, you know, you, mm. you're like a brick. You'll yeah. be out of this, you know, in no time. Yeah. Well, when yeah. four people die in a row, that takes longer. I mean, in the literature, it's called multiple losses. Yeah. And recovering from multiple losses takes longer than recovering from one. Yeah. And sometimes you go backward on the healing path and catch yourself and then turn around and go forward again. And, and that is the nature of grief. But I think with each step that you take on the healing path, and, and your healing path is personal, but each step, if, even if it's just tiny, mm, yeah. it's a step forward and helps you and helps you create that new life that you deserve. Yeah, seeing everything is a miracle. You said that, and that's so true. It's a miracle to be here, to be alive. Why not embrace that? I do understand and acknowledge the limitations and conditionings of, for some of us, and that's um, also part of this amazing experience called life. Wow, let me see. I have a few more warm-up questions for you. The next one is about true power. From your perspective, what would that be, true power? Perhaps true power is the, the power to see yourself realistically uh, and change behavior and, course, and your course if you need to. I think it's something that sort of learned as you age. I don't think younger people at times realize the personal power that they have. But if you make up your mind, and I made up my mind uh, after multiple losses, that death was not going to be the winner. Life mm -hmm. was going to be the winner. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would make it so. And ever since then, mm -hmm. I've been working on making it so. Mm -hmm. And this led to me writing what is now about to be 10 grief resources and uh, I keep at it. It's so interesting to me that um, when the pandemic first started in the earlier weeks of that, I tested positive for COVID. Oh, oh. And thankfully, I never developed any symptoms. Yeah. But that got me wondering about children's grief. I do have a Bachelor of, of Science degree in early childhood education. And I began wondering about children's grief and how were they feeling? How were they coping? And so while I was quarantined, and it turned out I was quarantined twice, I actually wrote three books for children, three grief healing books. Talk to me about the main intention of writing Grief Doodling. Is this book only for children or we can all use it? Grief doodling started out as a resource for teens because I heard that a CBS News broadcast uh, reported that about 40,000 children in the United States were grieving uh, for a parent who died of COVID. And that is kind of an old statistic now, but just think about it, 40,000. Yeah. Yeah. And most of them were teens. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll write a book for teens. And because of my early childhood education training, I know that sometimes kids don't have the words yeah. to say what they want to say. True. They don't have the vocabulary, or teenagers may just not want to share. Yeah. But they do express their feelings in pictures. And so all of a sudden, I got to thinking about doodling. Now, I have a master's degree in art education. So for me, that was kind of a logical thing. Yeah. And at that time, my husband was dying. 
And I had to admit that to myself. I had to say the D word. My husband is dying. And my stress was so great by then. Uh, it was my 23rd year as a, a caregiver that I, I thought, how can I reduce my stress? And one of the things I started doing was doodling. And there are basically two kinds. One kind is your subconscious expressing yourself. And the other kind is called art doodling. You kind of think about what you're doing. So I started doing art doodling for a half hour every day early in the morning. And I found out, much to my amazement, that a half hour was almost like a nap. That yeah. I forgot my problems. I forgot the, the, all the things that I had to do, mm -hmm. all the tasks that waited for me. And when I was finished with that doodle, or maybe I would finish it later, I was refreshed and I could go back to caregiving and taking care of my husband. And so that led to grief doodling. I figured if it helped me, it could help kids. So I talk about some very easy techniques that you can use. One is just putting dots on paper. I mean, you know, a, a two-year-old, even a one-year-old can put dots on paper and other right. techniques. And when you have them, you can do thousands of doodles. But wait, what makes grief doodling unique is that there are doodling prompts. And these come from decades of research that I have done on grief and from my own extensive grief experience. What a wonderful work. I've been through the book. I looked at it. I love the art. And you also are the, uh, the illustrator of the book. Yeah, it's beautiful. How did you become a health and wellness author? Harriet? I started writing uh, actually 43 years ago. And I started with a book about toys that I had invented for children. And then I you know, kind of got steered over to health and wellness. And after all, I my husband uh, was a physician. So uh, medical topics were often the conversation uh, that we had. So I just felt it was a good fit. Now, I have still written children's books. I have a book in production now. And then Daisy a Day is not available. That is my second book in production. Right. Yeah, I saw the cover. I think the newsletter you sent me, that had the cover of Daisy a Day, but not on Amazon. Right, right. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that. So let's talk about doodling. The benefits in the book, you mentioned so many. Calming affects thinking. So talk to me about how does doodling affect thinking? What are the processes? How does it happen? Well, I, doodling... It is an expression of feelings, just like all art is an expression of feelings. And you may discover some feelings that you didn't realize you had. I mean, maybe you make a very ang angry doodle with lots of spikes or lots of dark places. And by the way, I like to doodle with a felt tip pen. You can add colors, but I, I use a felt tip pen, black. So you may discover feelings. You may become more aware of how you are coping. You may think, well, I haven't made any progress, but, um, you know, I, I think I'm making progress. And your doodles can become kind of happier. But the most wonderful thing to me about doodling is that there are no mistakes. I mean, it's a doodle. So if you make a crooked, wonky line, it doesn't matter. And that, so you are transmitting feelings. You are transmitting some of your thoughts uh, from your subconscious. It's a creative way to express yourself. Some people feel doodling is spiritual, and they may meditate uh, before they doodle. Uh, they may meditate while they are doodling. And then at the end, if you keep doodling, I think you kind of get to know yourself a little bit better and understand yourself. Talk to me for a moment about the importance of knowing oneself. And what would that be, Harriet? What would that be to know oneself? As we celebrate more birthdays in life, I think 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> get to know ourselves a little bit better. <laughs> True. <laughs> I, I have discovered, uh, <laughs> and, and now that I'm uh, in my 80s, that I am a strong person. I am more accepting, I think, than I was as a young younger person. I realize that I don't have to have an answer to everything. I do have the right to remain silent. I have the right to speak up for what I think is fair and good. And if I don't agree with someone, I still can like them. I wish our nation would learn that again, especially the Mm -hmm. politicians. We can disagree with each other, but we don't have to hate each other. And we can disagree in a kind and gentle way. Uh, Sometimes I will say, um, I see that from a different perspective. And I'm very careful in how I say that and the pitch of my voice. And I may say, yeah, and you know, this is what I have learned or this is how I feel. But I still care about that person. They are still my friend. So um, I think we are constantly a work in progress all through life. For you at 86, what is the meaning of age, of age and aging, Harriet? How do you interpret that? I hope the meaning of aging is changing. I know that uh, sometimes I'm walking a narrow path. People assume that uh, if I'm in my 80s that I must have dementia, uh, and I surely don't know what I am doing. And (laughs) it it, it does make me laugh because... (laughs) <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't have two books in production, which will make a total of 44 uh, right, if I was right. demented. I wouldn't be giving webinars on Zoom. Uh, I wouldn't right. be writing a column for a newsletter. I wouldn't be volunteering in the community. And I think right. we have to revise our concept of aging. And much of this is due mm-hmm. to advances in medicine. But... Um, While medicine is advancing, I think we still need to focus on being kind, loving human beings. And, you know, that's part of wisdom. Uh, I hope that we will be more gentle with the older population. Americans are not very good at that. Other cultures, uh, in the Oriental culture, uh, grandparents are revered. In some parts of our country, I think, Grandparents are looked on as discardable people, but we're not done yet. Grandparents and great-grandparents like me, we still have goals. We still have things we want to achieve. We still have interests. I live in a retirement community, and I know someone who uh, took up banjo lessons. Yeah, that's beautiful. (laughs) If you're going to do it, boy, now is the time. (laughs) Yeah. And I think I have, since I have suffered the worst thing that any parent can suffer, which is the death of a child, I survived that. And I thought, you know, again, I'm not going to just survive. Mm. I am going to tackle life and I am going to thrive. And Mm. that has given me courage that I didn't know I had, given me determination, and has led to more books. I mean, I'm doing things now that maybe even saying things that I didn't think I would do before. So in your book, you say, uh, you talk about doodling throughout the book. I went through the book and I was looking for um, anything that caught my attention. And you write about doodling being fun and uh, because it's also therapeutic, which it is the case uh, for all the reasons that we um, that we mentioned earlier. And um, something else caught my attention was grief comes from love, of course. Yeah, grief comes from love. That's one of the first doodles. And then um, you say something else. Yeah, there's a one section you say, nope, not over grief. So you say, some friends think you should be over grief in a few weeks. Wrong. You don't get over grief. You learn to live with it. So that's a powerful message because I think that's another misconception, another myth in in the United States and where I come from too, Brazil, 
that we have this idea. We have this, uh, let's say, disconnected relationship with pain. It seems like we try to avoid pain. That's what we look for, to escape pain all the time. So talk to me for a moment about that, escaping pain and our misconceptions about grief. There's only one way to survive grief, and that is to go with the pain and go through it. I mean, there are times when I am caught unawares, and this happened to me the other day, and I just burst into tears. And what made me burst into tears? Well, I was getting ready to eat dinner, and I looked at the, the dents in the table that my husband's wheelchair had made. He was disabled. And I thought about him and I thought he never complained once. He never said a word about being paraplegic. We told each other we loved each other every day. And yet, you know, at the end of his life, he knew he was dying. I knew he was dying. Uh, We didn't talk about it a lot. We had been married for 63 years. Wow. Wow. And so I think it was just an unspoken agreement that we would cherish the remaining days that we had together and just not go off on this tangent of <laughs> total sadness. Yeah. You do, I mean, you. it is work. Uh, and accepting pain and accepting emotional pain is work. But tears are cleansing. Tears mm. say things that maybe we cannot speak. Yeah. And if you watch yourself and observe yourself after a good cry, you feel better. You've released those feelings. Uh, You can kind of get on with what you need to do. And I didn't know that I was going to be giving workshops on doodling, but that is what has happened. I gave a workshop uh, to my retirement community that I I live in, uh, a high-rise apartment. And one woman, when she left, said, I expressed my feelings in a good way. It's better than throwing eggs at the wall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah true. Oh, that's that's, <laughs> course, that's funny. I wouldn't throw eggs at the No, wall. no, no. <laughs> the mess. Right. <laughs> she she made a good point. It's better than throwing eggs <laughs> at the wall. And you yeah. are expressing feelings in a healthy way. So true. Yeah. No, laughter. That's another. Seems like it's part of wisdom, isn't it? To be able to laugh of ourselves. And um, yeah, you can laugh at yourself. You're making progress. (laughs) True. Yeah. We're getting to know ourselves better, who we are. Silly. (laughs) A lot of times. There's another question that I want to ask. Yeah. I've been exploring these ideas of the idea of feelings. Do you see love and grief both as a feeling? Oh, it's love something beyond feeling a feeling. I think historians and poets and teachers have been grappling with the definition of love for centuries. I think we will still be grappling with it uh, in many years to come. But when you change your thinking and when you say, I'm going to start this day, maybe by giving a friend a helping hand, Uh, Giving the gift of listening, uh, which I do consider a gift. We are in a very noisy world, and everybody seems to be good at speaking, but not very good at listening. And if you say, you know, I'm going to uh, try and accomplish something good today, I, I think you're making progress. You're not only loving others, but you are loving yourself. And, I mean, we are all worthy of self love Mm, yes, yes, a billion times. And with that in mind, would you say in this moment that you love yourself unconditionally? Would that be something that you would say it with confidence? I can be tough, I can be tough on myself. My my husband used to say, you work for a really tough boss. And of course, he meant me. Yeah. <laughs> right. I am yeah. tough boss. Uh, I'm being more gentle with myself. I, you know, after some health Mm. challenges, and I do have a pig valve in my heart. I had open heart surgery. So uh, I'm trying now, I have more time now that I'm not 
uh, overwhelmed with caregiving. Yeah. So I'm trying to walk more. I'm on the exercise bike every day. Oh, I, I'm really trying to get back in, in better shape. Yeah. Um, I won't be running marathons, mm-hmm. but uh, mm-hmm. I have to be in better shape. <laughs> So that's what I'm working on. And that is an expression of self-love. So we're almost at the end and I do have more questions for you. Another one came to mind is on relationships. What are your secrets for a great loving relationship, Harriet? I look back at, at my marriage, our marriage, which my surviving daughter describes as a marriage for the ages And in many respects, it was and always will be. Uh, We were partners. We respected each other tremendously. We never argued, never. Mm. There was not an argument in our home because we figured we loved each other so much. Why would you argue with that person? Mm. You could express a different opinion, but it was done in a gentle way calm way Uh and we always thought of the other one first and over the years it just merged and melded into an extraordinary marriage and an extraordinary relationship i guess if you were to summarize our marriage it was love and giving and i still feel that love so we're almost at the end, and I do have a few more questions for you. It has been lovely to talk to you. And I absolutely love, love, love your messages, and especially the one about uh, miracle. In your book, you do have that too. You say, Miracle Me is a section in the doodling book. Grief changes you. You are a more sensitive person now. Most importantly, you understand that being alive is a miracle, your miracle. I love that message. Perhaps if we, more of us, more human beings uh, understood this, our reality would be very different, more peaceful and more loving. I think it would be. And, And at the end of grief doodling, the person who has done, you know, followed the prompts, no matter what their age may be. And I'm finding people, adults are using it or giving it to kids who have lost a pet, for example, who suffered of a pet. Uh, At the end, you have literally a snapshot of your grief journey. And if you put the book away for a few weeks and then take it out and look through it again, that journey will become clearer to you. Thank you so much, Harriet, for doing what you do, for being who you are and doing what you do. So before we end our conversation today, I have a few more questions for you, the ending questions. Would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book? I can read um, something from the beginning. Um, it's, it's a letter yeah. to the person who purchased the book. Yeah, uh, It's a sincere letter. And it starts off with, Dear Grieving One, I'm so sorry, really and truly sorry, that someone you love and care about has died. Now you're upset and sad and don't know what to do. How can you help yourself? Doodling is one way. This kind of art is a blend of doodling, cartoons, and folk art. Why doodle? You do it because life is different in the doodle zone and doodling has many benefits. Thank you again, Harriet. So my ending questions, what is another word for healing? I think it's resilience, resolve. It's the R's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> resilience, resolve. <laughs> yeah, I can think about so many of them, uh, elevated words, right, <laughs> with the R. Um, and- <laughs> yeah, yeah. Two more questions. Let me see. I'll ask you this one. What is freedom to you? What is to be free? To be free is to be able to do what you would like to do without harming others. And freedom always comes with responsibility. Right. But if you expect 
accept the responsibility, freedom can be a true joy. And uh, I am grateful for all the freedoms that I have. And my last question is, what are three things about life you know for sure as of this moment? I know for sure that I will still feel pain because I love. I know for sure that I will probably write an, another <laughs> book because I can't stop myself. Yeah. Good, good for you. <laughs> yeah, good for us too. <laughs> and I know for sure that I am surrounded by a loving family. And that means a great deal to me. Thank you so much again for your wisdom, your presence, the work you do, and everything else in between. Thank you. And before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? You can go to Harriet with one T, HarrietHodgson.com. And Hodgson is H-O-D-G-S-O-N. Wonderful. I'll have the link on your podcast profile too. Thank you so much again, Harriet, and we'll talk soon. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Harriet Hodgson and her work, please visit HarrietHodgson.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.